Hi, this is Paul. One of the things any of you know who follow this channel should realize is one of the things I'm always thinking about is the definition of religion. What do we mean by this strange word? What specifically has the Enlightenment and its contemporary proponents, Protestantism for one thing, uh, what is it pushing against in some ways? And I want to talk about that. It's going to take a little circuitous route to get there. How does this connect up with um, the big, not the bit, the big issues of desire, morality, community, freedom? I'm not going to answer all of that in this video, but that is what this video is about. I might as well turn into presentation mode here. Whoops, there we go. Some of this is always Sunday leftovers for me because yesterday I preached on the Apostle Paul, and you can find my sermon on the church channel. Uh, I haven't dissected the sermon out from the main video, so you'd have to do a little bit of scrolling all the way up until about half hour, 35 minutes into the service to find the sermon, but I thought the, this week the sermon went a lot better than the rough draft. Um, there, there is something very real about preaching to an actual congregation rather than sitting here and talking into a computer, even though in my imagination I'm talking to all of you, and by virtue of the community that we've developed, we, you know, I have names that I think about, and um, at least representations of some of you that I think about as I make these, as I make these videos. This is a quote from N.T. Wright's book, Paul, a biography. In Paul's day, religion consisted of God-related activities that, along with politics and community life, held a culture together and bound the members of that culture to its divinities and to one another. In many ways, that's my religion, W. In the modern Western world, religion tends to mean God-related individual beliefs and practices that are supposedly separate from culture, politics, and community life. That's, in a sense, my religion S. And a long time ago, I had religion W, religion S. Religion as worldview, religion as a, a group of beliefs and specifically distinct activities that one might look at and say, well, that's religious. And in that sense... Paying your taxes is not religious, but going to church is religious. For Paul, religion was woven in with all of life. For the modern Western world, it is separated from it. So when what is probably the earliest letter, Paul talks about advancing in Judaism beyond any of his age, the word Judaism refers to not to a religion, but to an activity, the zealous propagation and defense of the ancestral way of life. And if you want to read more of those slides, they're in the sermon that I read yesterday. But I think N.T. Wright here quite nicely delineates religion W from religion S. And so I want to talk about that and play with that a little bit in this video. Now, a big part of the journey that I've been on over the last through three years or so has been continuing to understand what this word God means in our culture. And again, a, a, a real watershed moment of that was listening to the Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris debates when it was quite clear that Sam and Jordan had very different ideas of what this word means. And that's where I separated my God number one from God number two. And I've done some videos about that recently. So if you want to know more of what I mean by God number one and God number two, you can find it in those videos. Why have a word at all for this? And why you know, earlier questions of mine, why the, the crazy rise of Jordan Peterson and the interest around him and the kind of interest around him that we saw had a lot, I think, to do with the reincorporation of God number one into the conversation. And I think that also um, under law, underlay the rise of what we, what, we, what we might call new age philosophies and practices in the contemporary West. It's because in some ways Christianity in response and perhaps um, in accommodation to modernity increasingly took God number one out of the situation. God number one being uh, in him we live and move and have our being. God number one being holy, um, holy, holy, holy is God number two. The whole earth is full of his glory is God number one. That's from Isaiah 6. 
Uh, God number one being imminent, God number two being transcendent, God number one being the arena in terms of the metadivine realm, God number two being the agent within the arena. And again, those of you who have listened to a lot of my videos know what I'm talking about. Those of you who are only listening to this one for the first time, uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions. Folks in the comments will talk about it. One of the things that you need is sort of a word, a word for everything, but not just everything. It's everything and beyond everything. Um, it, it can't be a thing. It can't be within the system, as Brett Sockold says, but it has to, con in, it has to include process, but it still have ontology. And I think part of the reason for the rise of process theology also has to do with this, that... Um, the Western mind got so thing-centered that they needed more work on accommodating that which is not really a thing, which is sort of like process. It has to include agency, you know, God number two-ness, uh, which is at least as large, at least as large as humanity's agency, but not, own, our, not only our own individual agency, but the agencies of the principalities that we spin up and contribute to the world. And again, part of the huge question that is lurking behind all this are where do our principalities end and where do principalities that are before us begin? And that's not a terribly elegant way of saying it. Other ways of saying it would be um, when, in, in what way were, was the, the Nazi Holocaust demonic? In other words, what was sort of generated up from below emergence and what was given from above or even perhaps further below emanation to yield those series of events. And so in a sense, we, we have to talk about what is, what may be, and the loss of what wasn't. I mean, and, and in a sense, the term God, although all not, not terribly and, and I mean, theology is the working around of all of these kinds of issues. And so this is, this is extremely, this is a blunt force use of the word, okay? That's why I put it in scare quotes. But, but we have to talk about this. And so, for example, if you read the Bible, if something happens, God is at least partially involved in it. But again, in what way? It's sort of like saying, is, is the Jewish creator of the gas used to gas the Jews responsible for the gassing of the Jews? It's, a, it's actually a tremendously difficult question to answer. It's analogous to the question, are the, those, are the gun companies responsible for those that the gun, for the murder used, for, for murderers who use their guns? So these agency questions are, are tremendously difficult. And part of the reason I think the rise of Jordan Peterson was what it was, was, was simply because you, this word God is just so utterly necessary for, for, for actually thinking about just about anything, even though it's by all profession of many religions unknowable we we have to use it but we can't we 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 can't use it well but we can hardly live without it and in some ways our secular societies are testing those limits and then you have the ontological argument which is sort of easy to dismiss but very difficult to exile where once you once you ponder on what religions have, how religions have thought about God or the gods and, and that entire system, imagining that it's we're just talking about nothing or mere ideas doesn't really hold or work. And, you know, almost right away when I watched the Jordan Peterson phenomenon rise, I thought immediately of the ontological argument because Maybe some, maybe what I've just said will completely escape some of you, hopefully not all of you, and maybe by the time we get to the end of this video, it'll be more intelligible. 
So let's talk a little bit about consciousness. This consciousness is, is sort of a field of awareness. And again, defining words in that way isn't terribly helpful, but that, that's sort of what consciousness is. It's sort of a field of awareness. And, and it's, it's certainly a capacity that we possess. And, and in our experience, it's, it's tied to biology. But, you know, the big argument is whether it's limited by, by biology and especially biology is necessary for it at least the biologies that we know. And that's, of course, a big argument going both ways. And we seem to share it with animals. Uh, we know when animals are conscious of something or not conscious of something. We, we manage those ideas fairly well. And, and it's a field in, by which we respond to it in the environment. And with a cat, if you, you know, you can, if you sneak up on a cat or if you try the famous YouTube cucumber test, you have this little question of consciousness or awareness. If the cat is sleeping or if you, if you dope the cat so it's unconscious, you can put cucumbers by that cat all day long. But the, media, you know, the moment a, a cucumber is introduced, the cat will jump. And then we go into all kinds of questions about snakes and evolutionary biology and consciousness and yada, 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 all through that stuff. So, so we certainly share it with the animals, but, but now hierarchies um, immediately develop in consciousness. If I walk into a room and then maybe it's a hot day and I see a lovely cool beverage that I would like to drink, next to it being a Bengal tiger, all of my consciousness immediately goes to the Bengal tiger or a man with a gun, or a um, snake slithering around the floor. No matter how thirsty I am, I'm going to attend to the tiger or the snake before I, I attend to the, the cool beverage on the table. Did I mention a table before? No. See, and consciousness works that way, and, and this is some of the uh, what we talk about in terms of combinatorial explosion and consciousness that a hierarchy immediately develops, and why? Because we're limited and... Time, we're limited by time, and consciousness itself is a limitation. Consciousness sort of creates hierarchies, and 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 you know we pursue them. Now, desire is part of that motivation as well. And desire, like all of these other words, is pretty fudgy. So, um, let's say there's a uh, a cool beverage, um, an attractive potential sexual partner, and a Bengal tiger. Uh, again, in all likelihood, the Bengal tiger would win. But there you have it. That's the way consciousness works. Now, C.S. Lewis, Lewis in his book Miracles, you know, talks a lot about reason. And, and while we, you know, the, a cat would pay attention to a food dish and a cucumber or a real live snake, let's say, and respond to all of them with respect to a hierarchy, um, we also have this capacity for what we call reason. And C.S. Lewis almost, you know, deeply connects that with God in his book Miracles. And, and reason itself is somewhere between sort of a tiny miracle and a sacrament for Lewis in that book. And we as human beings have a capacity that far outstrips all of the other animals. And we have a capacity for um, self-control and, you know, movies and competence and expertise, you know, play on these kinds of things. So let's imagine the person walking into the room subdues the tiger, gets the drink, and gets the girl. Uh, we would be very impressed with a story like that. And a degree of competence or expertise would, would put together a, a scenario by which the hero of the story tames the tiger, takes the drink, and gets the girl. So that these are the kinds of things that we're that we're interested in, and reason is deeply connected with that because we have a sense that um, a cat or um, an elephant or a dog or another another you know even very highly complex mammal that we might what might we know um, you know might work on that puzzle. So lately, um, so the dog is dead, and so that we're just down to a cat. And we try to keep the cat inside because uh, there are a lot of neighborhood cats that have bested our little cat in terms of warfare. And our little cat got some little nips in her that she had to, um, had to heal from. And so we've been keeping the cat inside. And my daughter, who owns the cat, has um, put in cat-proof screening in a number of our sliding doors. 
and it's California and it's Sacramento, so at night we like to open the sliding door so we can get that cool Delta breeze into our house. But the, the cat, you know, ripped up the initial screens, but now one of the doors my daughter hasn't gotten around to, so we use an old a thing to block the door and so it's all always sort of spy versus spy versus the cat so i put an obstacle to try to keep the cat in and then i just sit next to it and kind of enjoy watching the cat do a degree of reasoning and you know the cat's pretty smart in a lot of ways but i'm a lot smarter and i'm a lot bigger and i'm a lot stronger and so if i pay attention if i am conscious of the situation i always win because i'm bigger and stronger and smarter than that little cat now that cat has a little bit more desire than I have for some so and but the cat also has consciousness and awareness so sometimes the cat wins if I'm not paying attention but if I'm paying full attention the cat doesn't stand a chance and we all know things work that way and that's sort of the the power of reason but I, I watch the cat try to work through these little they're not really puzzles that I develop but I kind of set them up in a puzzle sort of way because I kind of wonder well how smart is this cat and, you know, can the cat get out? And so I play with the cat in all those different ways. Now, but what I'm doing right now is I'm sort of stepping back from ourselves. And we have this capacity, too, that, you know, to the best of our knowledge, we don't know to what degree the cat has it. But we step back and we sort of transcend ourselves. And we talk about ourselves in the third person. And we see ourselves. And, and we do all of this. We do all of this stuff. And, you know, some of you might be listening and pull Barfield in here. And that's, that's quite right. But this video isn't about Barfield. Now, you know, I'm always thinking about these kinds of things and keeping an eye. And Jordan Peterson's putting out a lot of content. And I shouldn't be one to complain because I still put out more content than he does. Probably not as good a quality. But we're using YouTube for different reasons. Now, recently, Andrea did a conversation with Justin Brierly, which uh, I might make a little video and do a little commenting on that because I thought some of their observations about Jordan's second wave as compared to the first wave were quite interesting. So just recent, just this morning, the free speech and the Andrew Doyle podcast popped up, and I can't keep up listening to all of Jordan's stuff either. But Andrew Doyle, I've listened to Andrew Doyle on a number of things, and he's an interesting guy. And I really liked this conversation with Tom Holland. That was an excellent one. So I started listening to it. I'm not too far too far into it, but right away they had some interesting stuff. And some of it bore on this because I was thinking about this this morning. What kind of video am I going to make today? They read a really nice section on reason and language and some of these issues. So I thought, well, I'll put that into this video too. Why not? Well, and also the attempt to reverse the idea that intent is important. is That's even, that's even I mean, more... Uh, so they're talking about intentionality, and they're talking about it in in one of the big issues that's going on is to what degree is intentionality important. And I really loved all the comments in the recent video I did about the Peterson Michael Malice conversation. And as um, as Ginger Bill noted, uh, ooh, when when Paul gets a lot of you know when Paul when Paul does these things he tends to stick around there longer and so I want to get Paul right on Ginger Bill and anarchy and so Ginger Bill and I might do a conversation on the Bridges of Meaning Discord server about anarchy and um, I'll I'll probably do a separate conversation with Nate Heil at some point on anarchy I really want to get around to that and maybe we'll bring Sam in because uh, I really liked Sam's comments we had that little bit of a interchange on the Friday question and answer that last week but. This whole question of intentionality is interesting because we know that there are, you know, in my previous videos, I, I looked at Daniel Bonavac and in the 20th century, a whole realm, 19th and 20th century, a whole realm of sort of second level theories, which is uh, bulverisms. Some, some of them are in the form of bulverisms, as C.S. Lewis called them, where basically, oh, let's say, okay, so let's reimagine the room with the tiger and the cool drink, and the pretty girl. Um, what's my motivation for dealing with the Bengal tiger, the pretty girl, and the cool drink? Maybe the cool drink is self-preservation. Maybe the Bengal tiger is really, tiger is really self-preservation. Uh, maybe the pretty girl is propagation of the species. So what's going on in that room? And, and so what we see is that there are all sorts of layers to us where we are acting out, what are we acting out? Spirits. Let's just use that word because I think it's still the best word. We are acting out spirits in the world. 
And so then we have the question, well, was it me or was the spirit that was acting? And, you know, it's very interesting. At the end of the Joseph cycle in the book of Genesis, Joseph says to his brothers, who, of course, sold him into slavery, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And and this is where you get into, you know, some of the conversation I had with, with Brett Sockold, uh, these levels of agency, you know, primary and secondary agency as sort of Roman Catholic tradition has brought them in. Is, and, and our agency and God's agency, as C.S. Lewis noted, is not just sort of like this, that actually agency is, is a rather complex nesting of agents who are acting through. And so if I walk into the room and there's a Bengal tiger and there's an attractive woman and there's a cool drink, well, there's at least three and within me, even more than three aspects running through that room. And then you might take a step back and say, under what circumstance would Paul Vanderclay be put into a room with a Bengal tiger, attractive woman, and a cool drink on a hot day? Certainly somebody has been creating this arena in which Paul's agency will be tested. Fair enough. So so Peterson and and Andrew Doyle are talking about, well, now that we've got all these sort of second-level theories going on, and in the last video you had this woman saying, well, people might be racist and, and not know they're racist, and we have to hold them to account. And it's like, well, wait a minute. All of Western law has sort of been presupposed on notions of agency, and, and we do and we don't hold people accountable for, for various things like this. Catastrophic. It, it's always been a miracle to me that our legal system ever became psychologically sophisticated enough so that intent rather than outcome was what mattered, because mm -hmm. you have to be a... And, you know, that's not a new thing. You can find it in the Mosaic Code. You, you can find it in Cain and Abel. Where we got this idea is, well, we, it's been around a long time. And, you know, one of the places where it certainly has been around a long time is the Bible. And, you know, we get a lot of things from the Bible. Sophisticated thinker to see that someone has done damage to someone else. But, and so the damage is real and marked and and troublesome and costly, all of that painful. But because the intent wasn't there, the severity of the action is dramatically mitigated. That's a sign of maturity and sophistication to note that. And the fact that it's built into the legal system is nothing short of remarkable. And then to remove that and to make the the felt consequences the the arbiter of the reality of the situation is a dreadful assault on the integrity of the law as such, as far as I can tell. Well, moreover, it's something that everyone in, in, in intuitively understands. We all understand the difference between murder and manslaughter. You know, we all understand that intent actually does, like you say, escalate the uh, the severity of a crime. And 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 it's and it's it's bigger than that, isn't it? It's because this this idea that intention doesn't matter is actually built into so much of this what we call social justice discourse. If you think of critical race theory. Uh, it's just a given uh, that there are racist structures and you can be racist without intending to be racist. And I really... And, and as in the previous videos, we've talked about, well, how are we to think about the agency of these structures? How are we thinking about the agency of Uncle Sam? How are we to think about the agency of the United States military? And we, we talked about the fact that, I mean, these structures have implications and agency even when there's no individual moving in them. And, and that's the idea behind, let's say, something like systemic racism, that there's an agency at work. But what if there is no being, no individual, no person that we can lay our hands on and say, well, it's a function of the system? How does then does that work? We really do dispute that, because I think in order to be racist, intention has to be at the heart of that. Otherwise, it's incoherent to me. Um, but but this, is, this is really uh, a degraded view of humanity, uh, I feel, where we are effectively like marionettes um, and that we, we're just being played and, and that we don't. And so yeah. 
it, it, it's a rather humbling thing sometimes when I read the comments and I see you're predicting things that I'm going to go and do and I'm thinking, no, I won't. And I'm about to open my mouth and I that comment flashes in my mind and thought, oh my goodness, to a degree you might know me better than I know myself, at least in some aspects. What does that say about ourselves? What, is, what does that say? So, you know, back to the point he just made. We don't have a view of humanity, uh, I feel, where we are effectively like marionettes um, and that... We you know, that's that's behind the whole non-player character thing. And we're seeing that in ourselves right now in a pretty significant way. And, and we're not really quite sure how to... We're not really quite sure of all the implications for these kinds of things. But again, in terms of religion... This, this, these kinds of ideas have been have been underneath religious texts for a very long time. We're just being played, and, and that we don't have any agency anymore, and therefore uh, we can't be responsible for our own words. Not, not just our actions. We can't be responsible for our own words and their and the ramifications. So we have to be controlled, and we have to be stifled by the state and it's very it makes me very nervous so i've been thinking through um the importance of free speech i suppose from a psychological perspective and it seems to me that well we can walk through some axioms and you can tell me what you think about them if you would so <laughs> in, a, in a bingo game on jordan peterson conversations there's one i mean the first thing we might posit is that it's useful to think. It's better to think than not to think. And that might seem self-evident, but but thought can be troublesome and, and stir up trouble and your thoughts can be inaccurate. So it's perhaps not that um, unreasonable to start the questioning there. But I think it was Alfred North Whitehead who said that thinking allows our thoughts to die instead of us. And so he was thinking about the evolution of thought in some sense from a biological perspective. So imagine. So, and this is where I get on, on this, uh, this slide. And Peterson said this before. And I remember, I don't, I don't remember the first time I heard him say it, but when he's, when I heard it, I thought, Oh, wow, that's right. And that's really good. You know, if consciousness is sort of like seeing a field in your head, think of the matrix where, um, where Neo and Morpheus suddenly are, you know, they plug Neo in and he pops into this room and they go, okay, fill it up with guns. And, you know, consciousness is sort of, or imagination is sort of like that. With reason, you can sort of imaginatively manipulate that field and manipulate the elements in that field and run the experiments. And, and sometimes we do that sort of slow visually. Often we do it at, at much deeper levels where we intuit the outcomes. We don't, we don't play it out as slowly as, let's say, Morpheus and Neo do in the movie. We, but we do sort of run these experiments in our head sometimes very quickly. And we, um, you know, you can let's say you walk into the room and you've got the Bengal tiger, the cool tiger, the cool drink, and the attractive woman. Now, one of the things you're probably going to look at very quickly is is the Bengal tiger chained to something substantial. Let's say the Bengal Tyler is chained to a wooden table and then you immediately intuit that uh, that Bengal Tyler is going to move Tiger is going to move that table in a minute and I'm dead and I'm going to lose the cool drink too. So, but if the Bengal Tiger is perhaps chained with a heavy chain to the floor and you look at the floor and you well, it doesn't look like a wooden floor or the the mounting is going to pull out right away but it seems like a cement floor and so maybe you know, then I look at how far the chain is and, you know, we, we, we're so good at that kind of thing. We immediately, and again, we don't do it consciously, but our minds immediately do the math. And it's that sense in which our minds multitask, but our, our conscious selves are quite a bit slower, but still have this tremendous power. So, so you can do this verbally as well as visually. In a creature about the evolution of thought in some sense from a biological perspective. So imagine a creature that's incapable of thought has to act something out. 
a representation of the world or an intent. It has to and, and this is where in past visits I've taught videos I've talked about first drafts. And and one of the things that we do when we're very young is we just we're just absorbing these first drafts on us. And we do it unconsciously. And in fact <laughs> A uh, clinical therapist will know that you sit in the room in which you're always dealing with are people's f first drafts and, and you're trying to help them to edit it. And it's a remarkably difficult process. Those first drafts are so determinative. But again, it's, it's amazing that human beings can, in fact, change their drafts, their maps of the world and update them. It has to be embodied. And then if that fails, well, it fails in action. And so the consequence of that might be death, it might be very severe. Whereas once you can think, you can represent the world abstractly, you can divorce the abstraction from the world, and then you can produce avatars of yourself, sometimes in image, like in dreams, let's say, or in literature and fiction and movies and so on, produce avatars of ourselves that are fictional, and then run them as simulations in the abstract world, and so, you know, it's quite clear that trapping certain animals is fairly easy because, let's say, if we imbibe of the model of evolutionary biology, that the, the, the trap, the live trap that you, you can purchase on the Internet or rent if you've got a troublesome possum or raccoon or squirrel, uh, put a little bit of bait in the trap and put that live trap on the lawn, and that live trap is something that the the little animal has no experience of. It's a novel thing to the animal, whereas if you're going to try to get rid of the possum or the raccoon with a dog or some other type of beast, the possum or the raccoon would stand a far better chance against the dog than it would against the trap, even though the trap is dumb. All right? And, and we have this capacity to look at a trap, and in fact, we can imagine the trap, and, and we have all of this astounding capacity to manage this kind of thing and observe run them as simulations in the abstract world and observe the consequences and we do that in our stories we do that when we dream we do that when we imagine in images and depict a, a dramatic scenario playing itself out but then we all uh, and even though let's imagine that the all the machinery in our mind, and again, that's a metaphor, that we use for images, that's fairly slow. And when we're playing it out on the conscious field, like sitting there and watching it in the, in the movie Matrix, what, what happens is that over time we sort of intuitively know things. Um, we don't necessarily have them grasp, so we look at the chain on the Bengal tiger and we sort of see its weight. You know, if it looks like a, a piece of gold jewelry, we'll say, no, that won't hold. Um, maybe if it's mithril from the mines of Moria, it would hold. But uh, we, in our experience, we don't have that, which makes the story of the, the, the silver, the mithril from the mines of Moria so magical and spectacular. You know, we have all of these scenarios, and, and we just intuitively, immediately make rough guesses about them in our brain and act on them when we need to. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. And, and another amazing thing is that these levels are, are, are beneath our conscious self. And, but yet, you know, they, they sort of communicate with our conscious self often through feelings, through, um, through sometimes through actions because sometimes we act because the conscious brain is so slow. I've used the example before. Uh, your example, for, you know, your kid playing in the playground and a ball comes shooting at you and you see it out of the corner of your eye. You, know, you see it, but you're, it never appears to you and you duck. And of course, when we were kids, we used to play these flinch games with each other, you know, made you flinch. And it's like, you know, only the idiot doesn't flinch. But what are we doing when we play those flinch games? Who can sort of combat the, who can in a way surpass their natural ability because the natural instinct is to flinch. The unnatural ability is to sort of use reason to avoid flinching. And of course, movies are, are full of this thing. I've been, of course, watching The Last Kingdom and I'm into season four. And at this point, they torture poor Uhtred because they want to find out where um, the 
the daughter of the king is being hidden by the wife of the king who has now died. And of course, Uhtred won't break. Well, the natural thing to do would be, here's pain, tell me, tell, or even just ask, tell, but no, I'm going to keep it in. It's just, we, we leverage this entire machinery to, and again, machinery is probably a horrible metaphor, to, to act in this world in this way. Also do that in words, because we encode those images, it's one more level of abstraction, we encode those images into words, and those words become partial dramatic avatars, and then the words can battle with one another. So thought seems to work, let's say verbal thought, you ask yourself a question, you receive an answer in some mysterious manner, there's an internal revelation of sorts, that's the spontaneous thought, you know, when you sit down to write a book, thoughts come to you, perhaps because you pose yourself a question, and no one knows how that works, but... And, and it is truly an amazing thing, you know, when I sit down to make this video, I have all these scattered, disconnected thoughts, and, you know, some feelings, and you sit down, and it's like, vroom, out it comes. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from me, sort of. Does it come from the Holy Spirit? Does it come from God? I mean, how? why would we say that when the Apostle Paul sat down to write letters and said, and don't forget the parchments, we would say, well, this this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Well, what did the Holy Spirit care about the cloak and the parchments? Um, uh, so, but this is, you know, this is all of, you know, what we're playing with with these things and asking ourselves, well, well, which of those letters would be we would would we considered inspired by the Holy Spirit and which not? And what are all the things that go around it? And obviously to, you know, when I make these videos, I'm usually ruminating on these things while I'm doing things like driving or showering or doing some menial task. Because if I'm, you know, talking to my wife or my daughters or my sons or watching something on TV with them or, you know, reading a book tends to be much more solitary. So I'll read a little bit and I'll think about it and other things. And that's the process that we're doing. And it's, it's quite an amazing thing what we do. My, my cat certainly doesn't do it. We experience it, that thoughts manifest themselves in the theater of our imagination. So that's the revelatory aspect. And then there's the critical aspect, which is, well, now you've thought this and perhaps you've written it down. Can you generate counter positions? Are, are there universes that you can imagine where this doesn't apply? Are there situations where it doesn't apply? Are there better ways of formulating that thought? And But I would say with regard to critical thought, and to some degree with regard to productive thought, an indeterminate proportion of that is dependent on speech. I, I don't think it's unreasonable to point out that thought is internalized speech, and that the dialect... Now, that definition goes both ways. We might also say internalized speech is one of the things we call thought, but... We also call lots of other things thought, like I sat down in front of the computer and I pondered, uh, you know, I sort of had a sense of what I wanted to do in this video, and I, I, I probably wasn't thinking words in my head directly. When I start putting words into a blog post, into a sub stack, or, or onto a PowerPoint page for this, I'm doing that, but it's it's we might talk about is that other stuff thought well yeah we kind of do i sat down and i'm thinking about it sometimes that's internalized speech and sometimes it's just kind of practical process that constitutes critical thinking is internalized speech so you and i are engaging in a dialectic enterprise you'll posit something and i'll respond to it and you'll respond to that and we're 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 in a kind of combat. There's some cooperation about it as well. And we're attempting to formulate a truth more clearly, at least in principle, if we're being honest. We do that when we're speaking. So our thought, the quality of our thought is actually dependent on our ability to speak our minds. Absolutely. And then, could, so go ahead. Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more because I think speech is the way in which we collaborate on our thoughts you know that that's how it how it works you you refine those thought processes that you've described i mean i'm no i'm no psychologist but i understand this basic premise that that it, it, we, we have these various i'm not one either and i understand it too <laughs> thoughts that are con continually in conflict within ourselves unless we're able to articulate them and to engage in others through that process through that transactional process of speech uh, then those thoughts are never refined and they remain in this kind of infancy 
And this is yes, why well, they're all, they're as refined as we can make them as individuals. Sure. Uh, but that's also assuming that you even have the words, which you also learned in a dialectical process. Right, exactly. It's it's not as though the truth is ever uh, fully graspable, but we can we can get nearer to it through that collaborative process of speaking and articulating the thoughts. And in fact, even in the act of, like you say, writing or articulating yourself uh, it, as with your self authoring program, for instance, the act of writing things out uh, is what clarifies the the point of view for you. I've actually found that the 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 the, the way that I think about these issues now is largely a product of of the fact that I've written so much about it and change my mind through the act of learning how to express myself on, on these points. And, 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 the, and the consequence of not having that, that opportunity, I think is uh, something I would barely want to contemplate. And I think that, to give an example of, 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 uh, of the moment, which is that because any kind of attempt to have a discussion or debate about the perceived conflict between trans rights and gender critical feminism, because to even attempt that discussion at the moment will have such uh, grave social consequences and certainly uh, in terms of career prospects, major consequences, people will not have that discussion. I have people I know in politics, in the media, and they, they say to me quite honestly, I will not talk about this. I have concerns, I have qualms, I want answers to questions, but I absolutely will not open my mouth about this. And if you don't do that, uh, th th this is why no one understands the issue. This is why no one has reached any kind of consensus on this issue. All we have is a sense in which to have the quote unquote wrong opinion makes you a pariah. Uh, and therefore, I'd better not have that opinion. Well, then that's not a sincerely held conviction. That's just that's well, just the, if the that's not a sincerely held conviction. I, I you pause that and say, nah, what what on earth do we mean by those words? And you know, to bring in a little bit more human anthropology that I've just had in the recent videos, there's a real case in which each of us, as we're treated in this world, are these individuals. Um, I have a name, I have skin on me, I'm wearing clothing, um, you know, the people that I'm closest to in my life, let's say my wife and my children, I'm deeply tied to them, but we're all quite distinct. And no one would look at me and look at my wife and say, oh, you're the same person. Big, bald, hairy guy and this much smaller, far more attractive, beautiful woman, very different. And uh, sitting down and talking to us about things would very much yield that result. There are some ways in which we see things quite a much quite the same way. In some ways, they see things quite differently. And a good many of you would be quite surprised at probably some of the things that uh, we see differently and things that we see alike. That's that's that way in a marriage, but. You know, then there's my parents, and then there's my sister, and my brothers-in-law, and kids I went to school with growing up, and people in my church. and But yet at the same time, me, me is, is, is by no means just simply contained within this skin. There's me in all of your minds, and via these videos and podcasts, I have to one degree or another inhabited you. In, in each of your brains, there's a little Paul Vanderclay running around, either talking foolishness. And, and people who have long since stopped listening to my videos, there's a little Paul Vanderclay that, well, we don't want to, there's no point in listening to him anymore. Um, but there's all these little Paul Vanderclays, and there are all these tiny little me's that are out there. And, and obviously they're not afforded the same as me. The state of California hasn't offered a driver's license to any of those little me's in your brain, but um, the state of California has issued one to me, the one who actually sits behind a wheel and drives a car and has insurance and is liable and responsible for decisions that I make. And in fact, even if I impair my agency by drinking and I get behind the wheel and drive, I'm still held accountable. And so I say, well, Paul wasn't there because he was passed out, because he was drunk, he was unconscious. And so all of this is, is tremendously complex in what we do. The definition of wrong is continually transforming and in an unpredictable manner, then it's best just to sidestep the issue entirely. And then exactly. that leaves it murky and ill-defined and, and assuming that you believe that thought has any utility. And so when you're sitting down to write, when I'm sitting down to write and I produce a sentence, 
you know, it might have come from some theoretical perspective. Maybe I'm approaching something from a Freudian perspective or a Marxist perspective or a um, or. A and so we've got all of these spirits, the spirit of Freud and the spirit of Marx and the spirit of, you know, mixtures of them that they're all sort of speaking through him. Uh, an enlightenment perspective, etc. I mean, it, it's a it's a it's a psychological trope, I suppose, that we all think the thoughts of dead philosophers, right? We think we have our own opinions, but that's really rarely, very, very, very rarely the case. It's not that easy to come up with something truly original and generally make incremental progress at best. And so, and, and so if we, well, how are we to conceptualize these dead philosophers and these, do we continue to hold, put Marx on trial? Do we can, well, I was listening again to the rest of history, and they had a two-part series on Hitler. And in some ways, Hitler continues continues to be tried and tried again. But in other ways, Hitler sort of got away with it. If he, in fact, whether he took his life in that bunker or whether he escaped to Argentina, depending on who you believe. So this this is all a very a very complex thing. So your ability to abstractly represent the world and then to generate avatars that can be defeated without you dying is dependent on your incorporation of a multitude of opinions and that in itself is a consequence of i mean that works to the degree that communication is actually free and that you can get access to as much thought as you can possibly manage so yeah. i can't see how you can deny the centrality of free speech as a fundamental right or the fundamental right perhaps unless you simultaneously deny the utility of thought. But maybe if you are also inclined to remove... It, it's important to remember that if you're inclined to deny the utility of thought, that is a thought that has come through us. That is a spirit that has come through us. And again, I, I know some of you said, well, your use of principality, well, that's, it's highly metaphorical because... What is a principality? A principality is a region which is governed by a prince. And so, again, there's, there's a tremendous level of abstraction. I'm using that now. Part of this goes into exegesis of the New Testament when the Apostle Paul talks about principalities and powers. Um, my understanding of that is that he is talking about, well, I think he's talking about what we're talking about here, that there are... Um, Spirits moving through us, you know, the spirit of Marx, the spirit of Freud, the spirit of Jung, the spirit of Abraham Lincoln, the spirit of my ancestors. There are spirits moving through us, animating our thoughts, being involved in what we're doing. And, and when you start to understand human beings are like this, wow, we're, we're quite something. But then when you have to ask some difficult questions about agency and... Yeah, that's why it's hard to talk about. The individual from inclined to remove the individual from the central position of the political discourse, then maybe you can also make the case, at least implicitly, that individual thought doesn't matter and that mostly it's just causing trouble. But I think individual thought is key. And actually, even in the, 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 the outline you've described there, there is, an, there is individual agency in reaching a conclusion that has been articulated before, insofar as if you are engaged with a multitude of writers and philosophers and artists and ideas, and you've come out with a perspective, well, it, that perspective may not be original to you, but the process that you've gone through to reach that viewpoint is individual to you. It, you know, it, it, there is a power in that. So there's something important about that. You know, I no, very there's something crucial. It's if, yeah. if you're a practicing yeah. psychotherapist, one of the things you have to learn is to not provide people with your words too much. Hmm. What you want is for them to formulate the conclusion. And yes. you can guide them through the process of investigation. You talked about the self. And, and you have to ask, well, why? And there's a lot to that because, I mean, being a pastor, I would say that what, what I do as a pastor is older than psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is quite new. But it's not discontinuous with psychotherapy. I think in some ways um, psychotherapy raided the house that, um, that I inherited. But and pastors, we're thieves, and we tend to steal back some of what 
we have and maybe misuse it or use it. But, you know, even even just answering that little point that Jordan posed is is really quite critical. Self authoring process and which is online at selfauthoring.com that <laughs> The Freddie and Paul show yesterday when Charles J was in. Charles Jennings, the Charles Jennings channels to like and subscribe. And I've got this t-shirt on Teespring. <laughs> oh, I have the strangest life. It steps people, say, through the process of writing an autobiography, of analyzing their current virtues and faults, and of making a future plan. The utility of all... And, and what's interesting about that is, of course... you. Any attempt at betterment presupposes an image of better that we are moving towards. And, you know, a big part of this is, well, where do we get that image from? We certainly get it from each other. And I've been, you know, one of the things that I didn't talk a lot about was, you know, so, so many of our desires come from each other. We borrow them. We steal them from each other. You know, again, thinking about the work of Rene Girard in this. So... Yeah. All of that is dependent on the the person who's um, undertaking the exercise, generating their own verbal representations, right? Yes. And, and that seems to cement it somehow as yours if you've come up with the words. And so, it and, and so there's a there's a pragmatic reason for letting them do that. But of course, in the context of this, the You know, part of the reason Jordan Peterson resisted enforced speech laws was there's there's a subtle totalitarianism beneath this. In in fact, the world is such that you have to risk letting people have bad ideas, which is a pretty integral thing. And you know, I I don't like churches to become little tyrannies either. And that's part of the reason that I I I've mentioned before that when I do small group work. I, I, I try to tell people, you know, I'm not going to, you're not going to lose status for giving a heretical opinion. Why? Because in terms of who you are, I tend to think truth wins. And so go ahead and put your heresy on the table and let's talk about it. It's a lot better than just gagging you. And, and this is why I, I think the tyrannical left is... They, they they might do a lot of damage, but in the end, it won't it won't really go too many places. And so it's the it's the uppermost expression of personhood, the ability to have the words that you should speak reveal themselves to you, and to have the right to express them as you see fit. Yes, in which case, if you if you are merely re repeating an accepted script. Then, then, to what extent can you say to can you even say to be an individual at all? You know, th this this to me. Well, is I think, <laughs> and th this is some of the some of the way that this conversation goes. And if you're paying attention to the whole conversation, that's where it gets tricky because we want to, on one hand, affirm the regard for the individual, yet recognizing that individuality is itself a rather complex thing. That's part of the philosophical conundrum, is that if you believe that all people do is repeat pre-digested scripts, especially if your view is that the fundamental human motivation is power mm. and the entire social landscape is nothing but a competition between equally, what would you say, selfish and single-minded power strivers, then there is no individual there's no individual in that conceptual world. And it seems... And so, in some ways, our whole system is built on the idea that we are the only individuals. And it's difficult for us to grapple with these questions of spirits and the way we, as individuals, participate in them. And now, again, if I'm using this language, and some of you are just going to sort of... But if I use a word like principalities... Um, there's lots of ways that we try to express this, but it's quite clear this is this is a rather complex thing that is going on here.
seems to me that that's the world that we're being pushed to inhabit and are criticized for on moral grounds for criticizing. And Absolutely. I'm still trying to get my hands around this. I mean, when I went to Britain, I saw the CCTV cameras and the increased security. And it isn't clear to me how that's related to the social justice issues that so-called social justice issues that we're discussing. But they seem to me in some very difficult to comprehend way, part and parcel of the same thing, the same dangerous thing. Well, I think it's probably connected just in terms of this dis distrust of humanity or this belief that that um, people need to be shepherded, uh, other otherwise left to their own devices. Uh, well, we then are the, it's the principalities that we are creating that are doing the shepherding of the people. And we very much have, a, have an idea of exactly what and who these people should be. And so then we must shepherd them. But, but we're not exactly sure who we are because we, of course, are inheritors of these spirits and these spirits are working through us. Chaos will reign. I think that's, I think that's the connection. It's not directly connecting as far as the, the issues relating to liberty and CCTV obviously predate uh, what we now call whatever the current social justice movement is called. Uh, but I think there is there is something there. I mean, the, the, the set... <laughs> We're now further on in the video than I've listened to the first time, so we're, um, I don't know exactly, I don't know exactly where this is going yet, because again, I haven't listened to this the first time. We're at minute 32 of two hours and 23 minutes. I didn't even know I was going to listen to this podcast or not, but here we are. In the last video, someone put in a link by this uh, piece written by uh, Stephen uh, Father Stephen Freeman of the Orthodox Church. They can be found on Ancient, ancient Faith Ministries. Uh, it's so interesting when I look at some of the stuff because you see glory to God in all things, and I can think of how, how many how many conservative Reformed uh, think spots uh, would would use a phrase like that. Certainly not with a dome with with Jesus there at the top of it. Modernity is an abiding crisis. It cannot exist without one, and there it has the the Norwich Cathedral with the Helter Skelter right in the sanctuary. I thought it was a terrific piece. The idea that constitutes that the ideas that constitute modernity center around life as management. Modernity assumes that life can be managed, that human beings are well suited for the job. And this gets into where we left off with the CCTV cameras in London. And you know, interestingly enough, you know, based on at least the initial half hour of the interview I saw sounds like things are quite interesting in Britain with some of the laws that you folks have there and uh, good luck to you um, sort of happy for the First Amendment here in the United States its greatest success has come at the careful application of technology towards various problems which result with the rise of wealth the well-being that comes with wealth is limited to the things that money can buy non-tangibles Non-tangibles remain as elusive as ever. Modernity prefers problems that can be solved. And it's this whole issue of problems, which I'm going to get to it a little bit with the PowerPoint, where a lot of this is. Because once you have a problem, oh good, we can solve it. And then suddenly we feel ourselves like little gods of the earth. We get this little dopamine hit because, ooh, we solved a problem. You know, you can play Farmville and tink, 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 tink. Ooh, I'm solving problems. And it feels very good to us, all this um, modernity itself is in some ways a, a freemium model life hack of human beings. As such, the short history of the modern world is a story of civilization that staggers from one crisis to another. It derives its sense of self-worth and meaning from the problems it solves. It is essentially desperate for such problems. In, in a sense, modernity is, an, is a problem addict. We live for the next problem. No one historical event or idea created the modern world. It is an accident. It is an accidental philosophy made up of disparate elements assembled with the wake of the collapse of the medieval world, generally called the Reformation. <laughs> At times that gave rise to modernity were revolutionary and radical, or were perceived to be. It's heady stuff to be reforming the world. It's also exhausting. And, you know, as a Protestant, he's got a lot of points here. I've often thought that people generally have narrow interests. We want to work, to play, to love our family, to live in peace with some modest level of comfort. Of course, a consumer economy cannot operate in a world of satisfaction. 
Modern consumption with an ever-expanding economy requires that our dissatisfaction remain somewhat steady. The same is true of the political world. For people to vote, they must be motivated, like shopping. Problems need to be advertised so that people will vote for their will vote for their solutions. As such, our society has moved from crisis to crisis, slogan to slogan, with a faithfulness that can only be described as religious in nature. Though America invented the notion of separation of church and state, nothing is more political than the American religion, nor is anything more religious than American politics. Modernity is a religious project. That's really good. Religion per se needs no gods or temples. It requires purpose and direction and a narrative for the direction of life. Human beings are not constructed in a manner in which we live devoid of religion. The term itself is instructive, Relig religio is a Latin word that refers to binding. Ligaments have the same root. Religion is that which binds us or holds us together. Think of N.T. Wright's definition. Modernity as a set of ideas, and again, that's one way to try and construe this thing. Is it a spirit? Is it a principality? Is it a set of ideas? We're trying to get a handle on what it is. What Christianity what Christianity that continues to exist within it generally exists as a Christianized version of modernity. Modernity is a set of ideas, therefore, that answer the question, what would Jesus do if he was going to fix the world? Ouch! Some of my sermons, I, I, I address that directly. And that's often how I direct, um, as I, so I read that, I thought, ooh, it's, blows landed, good job. Ecumenism tends to flourish in such a setting because the religious difference between denominations are insignificant. That state is the state or the culture as state. Modernity has been marked by a series of quasi-religious projects. The new world itself largely began as a religious project. The problem is not escaping the persecution and American myth, but rather it was a dream of building a new world according to the radical ideas of English Puritanism, or at least New England. Well, I would argue it's probably push-pull. The rights of man exploded as a religious campaign in France, sweeping away the old order as well as not a few heads. Again, it is a mistake to think that such fervor is political in nature. Politics is about governing. Revolutions are always religious in nature. People believe in them. And I, as I mentioned with Paul Anleitner, and as someone had commented on in the comments to that, how it is remarkable that the French Reformation happened in France. Well, of course, well, the French Reformation wasn't the French Reformation, it was the French Revolution. But in a sense, one of the, one of the questions I continue to go back and forth was, to what degree was the Protestant Reformation inevitable? inevitable? And maybe... If the Protestant Reformation doesn't happen, you wind up with a revolution sort of like you have in France or in Russia. And that's something really to think through. One of the commenters made that point about Russia. I hadn't thought of Russia, but in the conversation with Paul Anleitner, I thought about it with respect to France, and it, it continues to sort of inhabit me, that thought does. America's westward drive can only be understood as a religious campaign. No such, such as Manifest Destiny married the American project to the book of Judges and the conquering of the land of Israel. Bob Dylan observed, you don't count the dead when God's on your side. The single greatest act of idiocy of the, pro of the modern project was the war to end all wars. The mass carnage of an entire generation was brought nothing of significance as a result. Again, mere governance is incapable of such madness. Only the blindness of false belief can create such nightmares. Now, there's a, there's a, a, you know, I don't think he's, I don't know that I disagree on the surface with many of his thoughts, but again, part of what consciousness does in writing distills is you take this vast world and you compress it down to this and you'd have to say, well, you know, read Jenkins' book on the First World War as a holy war. There's a lot of layers to that. But his, you know, he goes through the Cold War, Oakville, Tennessee, where he's from. The religious character of the current crisis is not to be found in a concern for the environment. Rather, it is in the concern for a crisis. How desperate things has, um, how desperate things are has little or nothing to do with the matters at hand and everything to do with modernity's separate need for purpose and meaning. The very people who wring their hands about future suffering justify present suffering, such as wholesale slaughter of the unborn, and that it is present, um, and that its presence helps pay for the uninterrupted lifestyle of consumer capitalism. 
The concerns of, of modernity's religious demand often contain an element of truth. That same truth is, is ultimately swallowed up by an unintended destruction that provides for its way of life. Christian theology has concern for all things. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. As such, it's possible to construct a theological account that supports the various projects of modernity. However, the church does not exist to serve the demands of a false narrative. Coming to understand who we are and why we are is essential to orthodox existence. Its, in, its endangerment may be the only crisis of our time. A very interesting article, and I, I really liked how he, you know, especially how he got it going. So we've got all this stuff going on and we're conceptualizing it. And language is one of these vehicles that we use to to deal with it. What I sort of liked about, you know, in that sense, in, in Freeman's piece there, modernity itself is sort of a, a second level theory. We're on the surface, we're occupied with uh, the environment or the loss of, you know, relativism, you know, whatever, whatever boogeyman whatever group is facing underneath it's we're just simply we're, we're sort of a a cultural hysterionics where it's simply from crisis to crisis as a pastor you know people that are like that and when they don't have a crisis in their life they simply manufacture one and so this is one view of looking at modernity because it, it's sort of like the person who is let's say high in conscientiousness that absolutely must have a tidy office speaking about a, an individual who's, um, whose mind is going and if he knew that he was you know entering into the hallway of his retirement home in his underwear, he would be horrified and sometimes he can be found in neighbors' rooms tidying up the kitchen. And that's completely obvious to me because such a person before the loss of their coherence would never leave a dirty dish or dish sitting on the counter. Oh, well, there are dishes to do. And and in that way, modernity is sort of like, oh, good, more dirty dishes that we can clean. I like I like the feeling of cleaning up the kitchen. So here we are with time, with Kronos and Kairos. Of course, Kronos is time that goes like this, and Kairos is moment, moment, moment. This rational, manipulative, imaginary consciousness requires a degree of time and peace among us. Quiet down now, I need to think. Well, I, in an earlier video, I reflected on the difference between, let's say, uh, sitting in a quiet wood and sitting in a city street. Why do the two have such a different quality? Well, the wood certainly is, at one degree, just as complex, um, but in another way, not nearly as complex as the city street. What are the differences in their complexity, and what does that have to do with us and our consciousness? Someone recently contacted on me on Twitter and wanted to talk about flow states, and I'm not an expert in flow states at all. But, well, if you're, let's say, shooting down a rapids you do that to sort of stay in a flow state. And it's almost the opposite of a quiet room where I can collect my thoughts and think rationally about the world or a meditative room where everything is quiet and in a sense I go into my own mind and try and establish a flow state whose input directionality is quite different. So Often we live in a world of physical threats. Let's say if you're, you know, I like watching the show alone. Um, and I, because the current season wasn't coming out fast enough for my myself, my wife, and my son, who's back for the summer, as uh, and he's an alone fan. So we, we never watched season one. So I went to season one, really enjoying season one, because those, those are the babes in the woods. You know, by season eight, you just have the hardcore survivalists. And yeah, there's bears in the woods. We know that. And they take the bear seriously. And they have all sorts of ways of competence, ways of dealing with the bears and the wolverines and the muskox and, and the like, but with the new folks just plumped into the woods and first night there's a bear outside their tent, bang, they're gone. Um, 
So the physical threats, the mental anxieties, the biological needs, all these things disrupt. I can sit here and I was sitting here thinking through this and oh, they got to go to the bathroom. So get up and walk across the church and, you know, go to the, go to the bathroom and then come back here. And well, on the way between here and the bathroom, I, my um, my thinking process was interrupted by a bunch of other processes, which also sparked in some cases new insights, but in other cases a disruption. Oh yeah, where was? Some of you might have noticed the break in the video. I got a phone call from a, a woman who just recently had, um, uh, she's a widow herself and her son passed away unexpectedly. Her son was living with her. And so, you know, I see on my smartwatch that she is calling and bang, this video stops. I go and talk to her for an hour and then come back here and it's like, I've lost all the flow. While our minds multitask, our conscious selves really do not. Um, flow is all about a uniformity. We focus on one thing at a time with this phenomenal ability. We reason and we process and we, we use our imaginations to move things around. Now, because of this, we, we in fact need community because what we do then, because we don't multitask with this tremendously powerful thing, Community is the we is the means by which all of our we 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 network up these consciousness processes that we have. I'll focus on this. You focus on that. You focus on that. We can do task switching quickly so we can check up on each other, but then we keep focusing on that. And and what this network needs obviously is trust. And you know even in inter in the internet world we're dealing with that. Um, you know, can this is the, does this node have a virus? If this node has a virus, you know, we need to take this node out of the system. But this world that we're dealing with is is of far more complexity, and each of us as a as an individual, or you know, we're far more complex. So can we trust each other? And this is part of the reason we trust family because our trust is built on time and chronos and history and how we've treated each other and and the mapping I have in my mind of you is is put together by time. I've seen you in different circumstances and and I know you and even the ways I don't trust you I've sort of accommodated for that. And so if I sort of see you going on as you do, then suddenly you do something different and now I know when to watch. And I deal with this with the homeless people with schizophrenia or bipolar or alcohol. I mean I you know, people come to me and they look at me and well pastor is that person dangerous? Well yes. But I've been with them long enough now that I sort of know the tells. And, well, there's a chance I could be wrong and they could surprise me. Like, you know, when a lion tamer, the lion turns on the lion tamer and, well, the lion is complex too, and but wasn't fully mapped and can't be fully mapped. And you have this with dogs and cats and all kinds of other things. But we use community for that. And it's by community that we sort of scale up this consciousness power that we have when we can't multitask, even though our brains are, my heart is beating. There's, there's all sorts of systems going on. And my brain keeps that from my consciousness so that my consciousness can actually focus and, and do things in front of me. So we manage everything. And now we're back to, I want to just... God, we relate to God by cooperating with each other at, an, at another level with an astounding degree of separation from anything else we know in creation. And, and this is, so when, when human beings get together in community, well, they start to change the environment to facilitate the community. And of course, you know, there are game trails and there are, animals do this to a degree, but but not like we as human beings do. And so trust is absolutely central to this entire endeavor. And, and trust, again, is an interesting thing because it's also built on history. And it's a mapping of, well, if you do this, you'll do that. If you do this, you do that. And, and we sort of understand that if something outside the system happens, like let's say there's a death or... Um, you know, they don't get drunk very often, but when they hit the bottle, watch out. I mean, we all know this about each other. And, and, but then now when a stranger comes in, it's like, well, I don't have a mapping of you. So then we'd use reputation to say, well, so-and-so I trust them and they say you're a trustworthy person and I trust their judgment. So I will, I will lend you trust on their behalf. And with all of these networks, then what do we do? We sort of see the world through each other. That's what communities do. We see the world through each other. But now our view of the world then is quite different 
from seeing it directly. It's way more powerful. We need it to develop the kinds of life's lives that we're living. I don't sit here and wring my hands about the alcohol problem of the person working down at the power station or the person at the treat at sewer treatment plant. Why? Because what we've actually done is scaled those operations up larger than the individual who might have an alcohol problem or the individual who might be in debt and via the organization, via the corporation, the public utility continues to maintain reliable, even if many of the individuals on their own aren't terribly reliable, because not all of their reliabilities, unreliabilities work in the same way. If everyone who worked at the sewage treatment plant was an alcoholic, the entire society would get rid of them and have a new matrix by which, oh, well, there might be an alcoholic, there might be a child beater, there might be a thief, uh, there might be various other things, but the, commu the, the communal nature of it distributes and sort of keeps in checks and balance. Well, so-and-so didn't show up to work now today, and we can cover for him today, but if he keeps not showing up for work because he's a drunk, well, we're going to fire him and we're going to bring someone in who is not a drunk or at least less drunk or at least doesn't have the kind of problem that's going to get into the works of this entire distributed system that the other distributed systems are necessarily connected to. And this is the kinds of things we do. Here's a little picture. You got Rod Hugan in here. You got John Van Donk. This is from a Southern California meetup before the, before the pandemic struck. Now, all of this has produced an enormously amazing system, and we call this progress. Kronos plus people equals progress because we have created these networks and, and we've We've differentiated and we have all of this reason and attention and consciousness on all of these problems. And modernity being sort of a, a thing addicted to problems, well, we're problem solvers. And you can do a lot of things solving problems. But, but problems at a certain level, um, they're what we've been working on. But what exactly is a problem? And Verveke gets into that a bit in his awakening from the meaning crisis. Because the question of what exactly is a problem is a piece of the puzzle and a piece of this progress that we're seeing. And, and that's what Freeman's work sort of brings out in that nice little piece. We don't know the limits of an accomplishment until it collapses. And, and so, you know, I've been reading this book about the Aztecs that was recommended, you know, that they did a podcast on from The Rest is History. And you know, they had this entire system, and the book is nice because it details it's a world that we haven't known much about, the Mesoamerican world pre-Columbian. And, you know, now we're learning more and more about it. And it's quite an intricate, complex world, and the author does a nice job of showing certain aspects of it instead of us having sort of this low-resolution human sacrifice image. Well, they did have human sacrifices, but you, you don't know the limits of your accomplishment until it collapses. And... That's just how complex this whole thing is, and in many ways, that's just how fragile this whole thing is. And, oh, now suddenly we've got some anxiety about it. Oh, more problems, and we're going to address that. Oh, but but what exactly are the problems? And and it's interesting that this, even this word problematic has become problematic. It never was a problematic word until it became problematic, and problematic was used in a certain way and how it's been used. And then when it collapses, we all suffer the quite literally bloody consequences. And, and that, that mystery of modernity brings me to something I read years ago, and it's, it's always sort of stuck with me. It's from Walker Percy. If you've never read any Walker Percy, you're, you're missing quite a treat because he's, he's a very interesting author. And it's the story of the dogfish, and I want to pull that up now and read it. A young Falklander walking along a beach and spying a dead dogfish and going to work on it with his jackknife has, in a fashion wholly unprovided in modern educational theory, a great advantage over the Scarsdale High School pupil who finds the dogfish on his laboratory desk. Similarly, the citizen of Huxley's Brave New World who stumbles across a volume of Shakespeare in some vine-grown ruin and squats on a potsherd to read it is in a fair as a um, read it is in a fairer way of getting at a sonnet than the Harvard sophomore taking English poetry too. 
The educator whose business is to teach students biology or poetry is unaware of a whole ensemble of relations with it which exist between the student and the dogfish and between the student and the Shakespeare sonnet. To put it bluntly, a student who has the desire to get out a dogfish or a Shakespeare sonnet may have the greatest difficulty in salvaging the creature itself from the educational package in which it is presented. The great difficulty is that he is not aware that there is a difficulty. Surely, he thinks, in such a fine classroom, with such a fine textbook, the sonnet must come across. What's wrong with me? The sonnet and the dogfish are obscured by two different processes. The sonnet is obscured by the symbolic package which, it, which is formulated not by the sonnet itself, but by the media through which the sonnet is transmitted. The media which the educators believe for some reason to be transparent. The new textbook, the type, the smell of the page, the classroom, the aluminum windows, the winter sky, the personality of Miss Hawkins. These media, which are supposed to transmit the sonnet, may only succeed in transmitting themselves. And this is the problem of modernity. The problem is itself in some ways because the medium is the message in some ways. It is only the hardiest and cleverest of students who can salvage the sonnet from this many-tissued package. It is only the rarest student who knows that the sonnet must be salvaged from the package. The educator is well aware that something is wrong, that there is a fatal gap between the student's learning and the student's life. The student reads the poem, appears to understand it, and gives all the answers. But what it does, he recall, but what but what does he recall if he should happen to read, po read a Shakespeare sonnet 20 years later? Does he recall the poem, or does he recall the smell of the page and the smell of Mrs. Hawkins? And to be fair and astute educators, church has all of this too. And as someone who is in church, well, and many of you now in your mid to late 20s or 30s or 40s have had exactly this experience because all you remember is the smell of the page and the smell of the priest or the smell of the pastor. And now suddenly you open the book for yourself and it's alive. Look at Tom Holland's experience. One might object, pointing out that Huxley's citizen reading his sonnet in the ruins and the Falkland Islander looking at his dogfish on the beach, also receive them in a certain package. Yes, but the difference lies in the fundamental placement of the student in the world, a placement which makes it possible to extract the things from the package. The pupil at Scarsdale High sees himself placed as a consumer receiving an experience package, but the Falkland Islander exploring his dogfish is a person exercising the sovereign right of a person in his lordship and mastery in creation. He too could use an instructor and a book and a technique, but he would use them as his subordinates, just as he uses his jackknife. The biology student does not use his scalpel as an instrument, he uses it as a magic wand. Since it is a scientific instrument, it should do scientific things. Think about just-in-time learning. Think about the think, think about the, the deacon Philip, who is told by the Holy Spirit, go to the Gaza Road and wait there and something will happen. And the Ethiopian eunuch comes by and the Ethiopian re eunuch is reading the book of Isaiah and... Deacon Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? How can I? The Ethiopian says, if there's no one there to instruct me. The Ethiopian is likely reading a Greek version of Isaiah, and Philip is likely speaking Greek. And all those things make a difference in the picture. Well, okay, how are we to understand this? Now, right there in that story and my telling of it between Philip and and the Ethiopian, is there room for God? And you might say, well, God number two, the Spirit says to Philip, go, go there. God number one has everything that has come up until that point, including Philip's culture, which has him listen to this voice and obey. And the Ethiopian, you know, was it a Jewish Ethiopian group? Um, you know, 
a lot of those issues come up, which, you know, were, were, would have been a distraction in terms of the sermon, but are, the comments are a fine place to put them. The entire world leads up to that point. And we'll get into a little bit more of the questions of, okay, why the departure of modernity and Protestantism in terms of Christianity? Back to the dogfish. The dogfish is concealed in the same symbolic package as the sonnet, but the dogfish suffers an additional loss. As a consequence of its double deprivation, the Saren Lawrence student, who scores an A in zoology, is apt to know very little about a dogfish. She is twice removed from the dogfish, once by the symbolic complexity by which the dogfish is concealed, once by the spoilation of the dogfish by theory, which renders it invisible. In other words, the dogfish isn't actually an individual. The dogfish, well, I'll keep reading because he'll, he'll go into this. Through no fault of the zoology and structures, it is necessarily a fact that the zoology laboratory at Sarah Lawrence College is one of the few places in the world where it is at all but, all but impossible to see a dogfish. Same is true of religion and church in some ways. The dogfish, the tree, the seashell, the American Negro, the dream, are rendered invisible by a shift of reality from concrete things to theory, which White has a, Head has called the, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. It is mistaken of an idea, a principle, an abstraction for the real. As a consequence of the shift, the specimen is seen as less real than the theory of specimen. As Kierkegaard said, once a person is seen as a specimen of a race or species, at that very moment he ceases to be an individual. Then there is no then there are no mere individuals but only specimens. And this maps quite easily onto the entire conversation about that Jordan Peterson and Andrew Doyle, because now there are no longer people. There are only specimens, and so therefore, depending on the color of your skin or some other attribute of you, everything else must follow because you are a specimen. To illustrate, a student enters a laboratory which, in the pragmatic view, offers the student an optimum conditions under which an educational experience may be had. In the existential view, however, the view of the student in which he is regarding not as a receptacle of experience, but as a knowing being whose peculiar property is to see himself as being in a certain situation, the modern laboratory could not have been more effectively designed to conceal the dogfish forever. What does he mean by that? Well, pragmatic in a sense, but the goal of the educational institution is to what? Well, please the teacher, afford a grade, um, see all dogfish as specimens, and therefore postulate from that dogfish a whole realm of the rest of the universe. It's a powerful thing, but we shouldn't forget that it is itself a thing, and that that thing is in the world with a whole bunch of other things, too. The student comes to his desk. On it, neatly arranged by his instructor, he finds his laboratory manual, a dissecting board, instruments, and a mimeograph list. Exercise 22, materials, one dissecting board, one scalpel, one forceps, one probe, one bottle India ink and shrins, one specimen of squalus acanthius. The clue to the situation in which the student finds himself is to be found in the last item, one specimen squalus acanthius, if I'm saying that right. The phrase specimen of the, the phrase specimen of it of expresses in the most succinct way imaginable the radical character of the loss of being which has occurred under his very nose. To refer to the dogfish, the unique concrete existence before him as specimen of Squalus acanthius reveals by its grammar the spoilation of the dogfish by the theoretical method. The phrase specimen of, example of, instance of, indicates the ontological status of the individual creature in the eyes of the theorist. The dogfish itself is seen as a rather shabby expression of an ideal reality, the specimen squalus acanthius. And there is, of course, no physical man manifestation exactly of that ideal reality. There might be prime examples better examples than others, but the fact that they all lie on a spectrum is telling you something about what's going on here. 
The result is the radical devaluation of the individual dogfish. The reductio al, al absurdum of Whitehead's shift is Toynbee's employment of it in his historical method. If a gram of NaCl is referred to by the chemist as a sample of NaCl, one might think of it as such, and not much is missed by the oversight of the act of being a particular pinch of salt. But when the Jews and the Jewish religion are understood as, in Toynbee's favorite phase, a classical example of such and such a kind of Vulcan von der Rung, can't speak German, we begin to suspect that something is well being left out. If we look in another way, in other, if we look into the ways in which the student can recover the dogfish or the sonnet, we'll, we will see that they have in common the stratagem of avoiding the educator's direct presentation of the object as a lesson to be learned and restoring access to sonnet and dogfish as things to be known, reasserting the sovereignty of knower over known. In truth, the biography of scientists and poets is usually the story of the discovery of the indirect approach, the circumvention of the educator's presentation, the young man who has sent to the technicum and on his way, feel, and on his way fell into the habit of loitering in bookstores and reading poetry, or the young man dutifully attending law school who on the way became curious about the comings and goings of ants, one remembers the scene in the heart of the lonely hunter where the girl hides in the bushes to hear the K-part in the big house play Beethoven. Perhaps she is the lucky one after all. Think of the unhappy souls inside who see the record, worry about the scratches, and most of all worry about whether they are getting it, whether they are bona fide music lovers. What is the best way to hear Beethoven? Sitting in a proper silence around the K-part or eavesdropping or or eavesdropping from an azalea bush. However, it may come about, we notice two traits of the second situation. Number one, an openness of the thing before one, instead of being an exercise to be lean, learned according to an approved mode, it is the garden of delights which beckons to one. Two, a sovereignty of the knower. Instead of being a consumer of a prepared experience, I am a sovereign wayfarer, a wanderer in the neighborhood of being who stumbles into the garden. In many ways, this is an answer to some of what Peterson and Doyle are playing with. Because in some ways, in this situation, they are an individual and in that way have, to a certain degree, broken away from modernity, if even for a moment, although modernity will continue to regard them as a problem to corral them. One can think of two sorts of, My wife texting me. Hang on. One can think of two sorts of circumstances through which the thing may be recovered to the person. There is always, of course, the direct recovery. A student may simply be strong enough, brave enough, or clever enough to take the dogfish and the sonnet by storm to wrest control of it from the educators and the educational package. Now, sometimes students do this, and they don't, don't, actually don't know enough, and, but at least there's a chance they might learn to know. First by ordeal, the bomb falls when the student, when the young student recovers consciousness from the shambles of the laboratory of the bio, biology laboratory. There, not ten inches from his nose, lies the dogfish. Now, if you read Parker, um, if you read um, Walker Percy novels, you know this is the kind of stuff he plays with. Um, now, all at once, he can see it directly and without um, directly and without. Um, it looks like a typo. Just as the exile or the prisoner or the sick man sees the sparrow at his window in all of its inexhaustibility, just as the commuter who has had a heart attack sees his own hand for the first time. In these cases, the simulacrum of everydayness and consumption has been destroyed by disaster, in the case of the bomb, literally destroyed. Secondly, by apprenticeship to a great man. One day, a great biologist walks into the laboratory. He stops in front of the students' desks. He leans over, picks up the dogfish, and ignoring instruments and procedures, probes with a broken um, fingernail into the little carcass. Now here is a curious business, he says, ignoring also the proper jargon of the speciality. Look here how this little duct reverses its direction and drops into the pelvis. Now, if you look 
into the coelacanth, you can see that, and all at once the students can see. The technician and the sophomore who love his textbook are always offended by the genuine research man because the latter is usually a little vague and always humble before the thing. He doesn't have much use for the equipment or the jargon, whereas the technician is never vague and never humble before the thing. He holds the thing dispossessed by the principle, the formula, the textbook outline, and he thinks a great deal of equipment and jargon. But since neither of these methods of recovering the dogfish is pedagogically feasible, in other words, in many ways it can't be systematized, and we see this, I see this again and again and again in systems. Um, you see this all the time in uh, educational methodologies and seminaries for teachers and you know all of these systems in a sense what modernity continues to breed for itself are systems after systems just like dogs breed dogs and cats breed cats now you might think i'm sounding like an anarchist but well let's give the anarchists their due they have a point about systems and in some ways uh, stephen freeman makes a similar point as does walker percy but since neither of these methods of recovering the dogfish is pedagogically feasible, perhaps the great man, um, even less so than the bomb, and I think in some ways the bomb is the approach of the anarchists, I wish to propose the following educational technique, which should prove effective, especially equally effective for Harvard and Shreveport High School. I propose that English poetry and biology should be taught as usual, but that at regular intervals, poetry students should find dogfishes on their desks and biology students should find Shakespeare sonnets in their dissecting boards. And I think in some ways this is Jordan Peterson talking to um, Jocko Willink about sonnets. I'm serious in declaring that Sarah Lawrence, Lawrence Major, uh, that a Sarah Lawrence Major who began poking around in a dogfish with a bobby pin would learn more in 30 minutes than a biology major in a whole semester, and that the latter, upon reading in her dissection board, that time of year thou mayst in me behold, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang, upon whose boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs were late were late the sweet bird sang, might catch fire of the beauty of it. The similar, the situation of the tourist at the Grand Canyon and the biology student are special cases of a predicament in which everyone finds himself in a modern technical society. So society, that is, in which there is a division between expert, layman, planner, and consumer, in which experts and planners take special measures to teach and edify the consumer. consumer. Measures taken are measures approx um, appropriate to the consumer. The expert and the planner know and plan, but the consumer needs and experiences. There is a double deprivation. First the, loss, first, the thing is lost through its packaging, the very means by which the thing is presented for consumption, the very techniques by which the thing is made available as an item of need satisfaction. These very, these very means operate to remove the thing from the sovereignty of the knower. A loss of title occurs. The measures which the museum curator takes to present the thing to the public are self-liquidating. The upshot of the curator's efforts are not that everyone can see the exhibit, but that no one can see it. The curator protests. Why are they so indifferent? Why do they even deface the exhibits? Do they know, um, don't they know it is theirs? It is not theirs. It is his, the curator's. By the most exclusive sort of, zoo, of zoning, the museum exhibit, the park oak tree, is part of that ensemble, a package which is almost impenetrable, impenetrable, impenetrable to them. The archaeologist who finds his museum... He, who puts his find in a museum so that everyone can see it accomplishes the, verse, the reverse of his expectations. The result of his of his action is that no one can see it but now the um but the archaeologist he would have done better to keep it in his pocket and show it now and then to strangers now let's turn back to religion and this word 
In Paul's day, religion consisted of a God-related activity that, along with politics and community life, held a culture together and bound its members of that culture to its divinities and to one another. Does that sound like a dogfish on a beach? Probably sounds like someone struggling for survival, finding dogfish, and wondering where they can get some fresher ones. In the modern sense, religion tends to mean God-related individual beliefs and practices that are supposedly separated from culture, politics, and community life. It is a specimen. For Paul, religion was woven in with all of life. For the modern Western world, it is separated from it. So when, in what is probably his earliest letter, Paul talks about advancing in Judaism beyond any of his age, the word Judaism refers not to a religion, but to an activity, the zealous propagation and defense of the ancestral way of life. Now, in all fairness to the biologists, they know a great deal about dogfish. And in all fairness to preachers, we know something of religion. But what kind of religion, and what package is it in, and how do we know it? Talking to the dogfish is really, I think, in our contemporary frame, what separates the religious from the irreligious in our secular world. One of the ways to see this is magic. Um, I just read a comment about enchantment and elucidation, and I think... I still have to watch Peugeot's conversation with, I believe it's Miss Green, about enchantment because I started it and they talked about how they didn't like enchantment. This is a lot of what we're talking about because in a certain way, the boy who finds the dogfish on the beach, that dogfish is enchanted in a way that the enchantment has been purposely wrung out of the specimen on the biology table. And that disenchantment has been wrought because one eye has been closed. In many ways, the boy on the beach pursues the dogfish with the spirit of finesse. And in the biology class, pursues the dogfish with the spirit of geometry. How modernity views magic, hocus pocus is of course something that was used to mock the mass. Different from how the Bible views magic. Well, the Old Testament is very much against magic, and in many ways, this, this lab leak that we're dealing with of modernity is all around us because, well, we weren't allowed to have magic in Israel, and that is perhaps the seed root of Protestantism. And I think that's actually part of what Dominion gets at. But yet, it's not just the seed root of Protestantism because what magic and the Israelites' command against it actually had everything to do with respecting the dogfish and respecting the maker of the dogfish and respecting that, in fact, magic, magic is a function of agents within a metadivine realm, a metadivine realm which the only morality that can be deduced from it is a morality of something that actually lacks agency, or its agency is simply a byproduct of the system. Can you learn anything in biology class? Well, sure. One of the, some of the videos I haven't treated much, but fortunately people have put the little links in, are the questions and answers of Peterson, because and some of you are like, well, why, why keep going back to Peterson? Well, because in some ways, Peterson is sort of like the guy who got kicked out of the bio lab right now. And he, he's sort of without his laboratory, and here he is um, working outside the lab and having to figure things out, and working outside the church and having to figure things out. And so many of the questions that come to him seem like such religious questions. And how on earth is a psychologist supposed to answer these questions and this in fact, one might become the subject of a video on its own, this particular question. How do I know if I'm a good person or a bad person? The biology lab can't tell you. Neither can the psychologist. And even rationality rules concedes this point because science only can answer it good for something else and its instrumentality is revealed. 
In a certain way, the boy and the dogfish, the boy with the dogfish on the beach, has a better shot at goodness and thinking about the goodness and badness of the dogfish. How do I know if I'm a good person? I struggle with viewing myself as a good human being who deserves good things in return, even though I try my best to be decent and add light into this world in a multitude of ways. What are some steps to take in order to become better than the person I was in the past? In other words, he's picking up on rules from the first 12 rules for life and finding I need to go further because instrumentality won't finally answer the questions. Now, part of what we're dealing with is that so much of this searching for religion is, again, to use the words I've often used because I haven't figured out any better ones, dead reckoning of better than wor- better or worse in the midst of what I'd say was swimming with the dogfish. And you won't learn whether the dogfish, well, let's say, You won't learn, dissecting in medical school, the cadaver that is before you, whether the person was a good person. Now, depending on your frames, well, you might be able to tell if they were a smoker. You might be able to tell how well they ate. But you'd probably be hard-pressed to tell whether or not they loved their neighbors as themselves. What does that tell us about this world? Oh, that's not a good slide to end on. So part of what happens in the Enlightenment is the lab leak, where we cover one eye and we we decide that this is the best way to approach everything in the world. And, And I think as Walker Percy and as Stephen Friedman's point makes, it's not the best way to approach everything in the world. It's a productive way. You can learn a lot from it, but... It's, it's actually getting in the way. And I think this is, this is part of why we're beginning to discard it. Now, we're beginning to realize the limits to the systems that we've made, and we're beginning to feel the anxiety of systemic collapse because, ironically, these systems are very, very large, and they govern everything. We think together as human beings. Um, one of the early videos I did with John Verveke uh, why is when I ran through this PowerPoint argument and, you know, at the end of the argument, he said, well, that doesn't really tell you about ontology and quite right. But for me, that's sort of where the ontological argument comes from, that if, in fact, the universe is such a strange place that the biology student, in fact, knows less than the person who swims with dogfish, um, but but again, you see that the, even the even the comparative knows less, knows more, um, doesn't really work. And to the degree that there's overlap, of course, which Walker Percy admits in saying, well, actually, we want them to know both worlds. Well, I think this is part of the reason why religion, as we know it, and getting after God is never going to go out of style because we simply need it, because the world is too big and we are too small and we are too connected and we have to see through each other in order to see the world. And what that means is that for the most part, we need to approach the world with the spirit of finesse, which I think very much means we need to talk to the dogfish. I very much understand that when you walk into the other little imaginative world that I've used in this video, if you walk into the room with the tiger and the cool drink and the... um, and the attractive woman, well, um, there's going to have to be a little bit of both going on here. But it's probably the case that the person who has lived with tigers will probably know how to save the girl and save the drink from the tiger better than the biology student that walks in and has intricate knowledge of the respiratory system of the tiger itself. It's interesting if you look at the Sherlock Holmes movies, the most recent ones, or at least the ones with the one with Robert Downey Jr., they in that way tried to ultimately wed these two and made Sherlock Holmes very much a creature of a particular world. I think if, when I say personal God, most of you think God number two, but if you expand it to understand God number one, 
really perhaps the title of the vision of the of the slide should have been why we relate to the world personally which is in fact what even after christian deconstruction people often tend to do and i think actually a lot of new age stuff which of course john verveke pushes back on is is sort of simply slipping it back into god number 1 and god number 2 without all of the wealth of wisdom that our ancestors have tried to bequeath to us. So we really do need a word. Everything and beyond everything can't be a thing, has to include process, but still have ontology at least as real of any thingness that we know. Has to include agency, but um, also can't be subsumed by a metadivine realm. Um, has to be at least as large of our own agency and therefore nothing that we can sort of capture in the way that I sit back and watch my cat. Um, it can't be dumber than my cat. In fact, it should be probably of a scale that sits back and watches me. And I know that there's a terrifying for us thing for us because, of course, we are people with real trust issues because, after all, most of the personal beings we have to learn to trust are also human beings, and we sort of know what they are. And so what we find is people who have, let's say, been from families that are good and wholesome are able to extend trust and do better, bigger things. And it's fascinating when Jordan Peterson talks about the fact that it seems the civilizations that advance most are the ones that can somehow manage to communicate a possibility of trusting one another. And at the heart of, of civilization collapse seems to be an inability to trust our neighbors and the necessity of sort of managing them because at the top of that hierarchy is either a person with real control issues or a principality that is indeed tyrannical. But then we again apply the ontological argument and say, well, if such a being or, see, even there, that's a reduction, and I have to use the word God because it is actually beyond that word, how must I relate to it? And, and the real questions are, well, the hocus pocus, does the mass actually work? And you have to ask, well, does the laboratory actually work? Does the biology classroom actually work? And what we find again and again is not like we think it does. And so if we were to approach – see – uh, all of the all of the different options run in my head. What well, being itself, the one Jordan Peterson likes to use. If we were to approach universe or existence, and I listen to people, I watch people have deconstructed, run through all of these all of these ideas, and each one seems to run into a problem. And finally, the only word that seems big enough to me is God. But once you're there, well then I think the historical options continue to lay themselves out and I wind up exactly where I started from. So maybe this video made no sense. Um, quite likely it's incoherent. Now, I've gotten... So when I was away for a vacation, and there's going to be more vacation this summer, so when I went away on, went away on vacation, some of you wrote me and said, YouTube used to promote your video to me and then it stopped well that's because i sort of stopped and i lost my pacing and this algorithm seems trainable and i've trained it in some ways so um i hate to give this little speech because i get tired of hearing all the other youtubers do it but the algorithm is what it is so if if you're afraid of losing my videos like and subscribe and then there's a little notification bell so you get notifications Otherwise, just surf the algorithm just like the rest of us. But So, yeah, I hope this was of some help. Leave a comment. Maybe it makes no sense, but it's what I had today.